please welcome Christian, if you want to sit here. Christian Taylor, David Chapman, Danny, warm round of applause for Danny <laughs> and Florence. Thank you so much, uh, Christian. This is such a, a wonderful film. Thank you for bringing all these um, different testimonies from veterans and, and French people in Normandy. It's, uh, it's a heartwarming film. It's a difficult film. There's a lot happening. And it's quite, uh, I, I think, for many people, um, myself, as I, for sure, you know, I think these days we know the big battles, we know the events, we know the facts. Uh, but we, I didn't know any of that, the stories, you know, it was interesting for us. It was just an empty beach and uh, there are alleys and the Americans fighting the Germans. But I think there's all these people living in Normandy was not something that we knew about or we heard about. And um, I think it's quite wonderful that you were able to interview all these young people at the time, <laughs> all children, right? Um, Christian, you mentioned early in the film that you discovered all of that too when you set foot in Normandy for the commemoration. Can you tell us what struck you when you arrived in Normandy? I can, and I would love to. But first, can I just give you a standing ovation? Because you were the best audience ever. Thank you so much for laughing and crying. I felt such support from you, so thank you. Um, yes, so what struck me the most? Uh, like I said in the beginning, I was blown away with how much everyone was thanking me. For what? I was just an American. But they would say thank you, and they would buy me meals, and they would treat me like I was royalty. And I was blown away because, as an American, I grew up thinking the French people hated Americans. <laughs> or that they were so snobby. Sorry. But... And I think in our American media, that's what we hear. So I realized that it was completely opposite from anything that I had ever experienced or heard about French people. And when I saw how they treated the veterans or the American military, I was blown away. And what, what made you want to make a film? <laughs> um, no one had ever made yeah. a World War II film from this perspective. I was a mom. I went to Normandy. I saw love. I saw an incredible amount of love, not war. And I was so curious as to how had that happened. And I had never seen any story like that before. So I thought somebody had to do it. I went back to all of my production friends in Chicago. And I said, we really have to make this movie. Can you please make this movie? And everybody said, yeah, you should make the movie. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, how hard can a documentary be? So <laughs> it was very hard. <laughs> and that was your first film. That was my right? first film, yeah. Thank you. And love is definitely palpable in your film, and it's quite wonderful to have, to bring back the human connections between veterans and people in the region as well. And, and Danny, Danny, you're... Memories are so vivid. Is that something you think about often? En français. En français? No. <laughs> no. Do necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I need to translate. Yeah. Est-ce que, est-ce que votre le souvenir sont très vivides? Est-ce que c'est quelque chose auquel vous pensez souvent? Je dois parler dans le micro peut-être. Yeah, you can speak in your uh, microphone and we'll translate, please. Voilà. You translate. Okay, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oui, j'étais très petite à l'époque, bien sûr, mais euh, la mémoire euh, des enfants commence dès 4 ans. Oh, yeah. Donc, yeah. donc euh, il y a des choses dont je me souviens vraiment. Oui, j'étais très jeune à ce moment-là, mais les souvenirs commencent tôt quand vous êtes jeune, à environ 4 ans, 4 ans. Oui. Yes. So you... Et donc, j'avais 5 ans au débarquement et il y a des, des choses qui dont je me souviens vraiment, comme le parachutage, par exemple. So, I was five years old uh, when the allies came, 
And I remember things very well, like the parachutes. Oui. Euh, C'était la nuit, très tôt. Et quand maman a entendu des avions, elle a ouvert les la fenêtre de la chambre. Uh, it was night, it was early, and when my mother heard, um, heard them, she opened the windows. Et on y voyait comme comme dans le jour, parce qu'il y avait plein de petits parachutes avec au bout des lumières, des fusées, qui éclairaient tellement pour que l'on puisse voir, que les parachutistes, pardon, puissent voir à peu près là où ils tombaient. And it was like daylight, because all, most of the parachutes were equipped with, with light, so the soldiers can see and the parachutes could see. Et... Lorsque mon papa, qui était revenu d'Angleterre car il ne voulait pas être sous le régime de Vichy, il est allé rejoindre De Gaulle. Et donc, euh, il, était, il nous a vus à la fenêtre. C'était dangereux car depuis l'église, il y avait des Allemands qui tiraient sur les parachutistes. So my, my dad had escaped to England because he didn't want to live under the Vichy regime and he had joined the Gaulle and he came back and saw my mom and I uh, by the windows and it was dangerous because the Germans was actually shooting from the church. Alors il nous a pris par les épaules, il nous a tiré en arrière et il a vite fermé la fenêtre pour euh, éviter tout danger, bien sûr. And so he pulled us back by our shoulders and quickly closed the window so we would be safe. Alors, on peut dire aussi que nous nous sommes endormis allemands et nous nous sommes réveillés américains. Uh, yeah, we can say that we fell asleep as uh, Germans and we woke up as Americans. Car durant quatre ans, nous avons entendu le, les clous, les bottes allemandes qui faisaient beaucoup de bruit. Et nous nous sommes réveillés avec les chaussures américaines qui étaient toutes douces. <laughs> we, for four years, we lived uh, in an environment with boots and the, the, the clinking of the boots on the ground. And we woke up with the uh, American shoes that were soft. soft. I have a hard time to believing this, but <laughs> that were soft, softer. Oui. Et il y a aussi beaucoup d'autres choses, mais bon, euh, ce serait trop long d'expliquer tout cela. Mais une chose est vraie, c'est qu'au premier anniversaire du débarquement, ma maman euh, a voulu absolument honorer les Américains en me faisant une petite robe mm. que vous avez vue pendant, dans le film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so a lot, a lot happened during this time, uh, a lot to say, but I would say that uh, a year later, for the first anniversary, my mom uh, wanted to do something special and put together this little dress that you can see in the film. Et il y avait beaucoup de parachutes qui traînaient à droite, à gauche, hein, de couleur rouge, de couleur blanche. And a lot of parachutes were laying around, of uh, white parachutes and red parachutes. Et donc, elle m'a confectionné une petite robe aux couleurs de l'emblème américain. Je vais vous la faire voir. So she made a little dress oui. of the col ah, colors of the Je flag. vous explique d'abord. J'avais six ans au premier, annivers au premier anniversaire du débarquement. Et donc, maman m'a fait une petite robe et euh, entre, je l'ai offerte au musée d'Utah Beach. And so my mom uh, made this little dress, I was five, and uh, offered it to the memorial of U uh, Utah, Utah Beach, Utah yeah. Beach. Oui. Et entre six ans et, et huit ans, il y avait tous les ans des commémorations. J'avais grandi, je ne pouvais plus mettre la petite robe. Et ma maman en a confectionné une seconde, identique, toujours dans du parachute rouge et blanc. <laughs> And as I grew and it was part of this commemoration, I grew, but I didn't fit the dress, but my mom made another one, also with parachutes. Yeah, and here it is. And just to explain, there were many colors of parachutes um, that l came down during the Battle of Normandy. The red ones brought machinery and weapons. Uh, the white ones were either medical, so they were thicker and they were uh, Yeah, I don't know what it's made out of, nylon. Uh, the reserve chutes were white and they were silk. Um, but there were blue, there were green, there were yellow, and every single one of them delivered different 
supplies, uh, and that's a small unknown fact here in the United States that I learned in Normandy. Pardon. des questions. And have you? We see you in the film at different commemorations. No, but I need oui, to speak oui. to these people. I'll translate for you. Um, we see you in the film at different commemorations, and were you able to see the soldiers that you interacted with when you were young? Yes. Ah oui. Oui, pendant des années, euh, pendant des années euh, nous avons eu, euh, évidemment, des, des Américains que nous avions reçus à la maison. Oui, j'en ai revu durant quelques, quelques fois parce qu'ils sont partis, malheureusement, sur d'autres fronts. So many of them, the, the soldiers that you met went back to the other fronts, right? Other... Euh, non, ils ne sont pas jamais revenus. Est-ce qu'on n'a jamais plus de nouvelles d'eux, sauf de Harry Kropnecke Oui, on, mes parents ont correspondu longtemps avec. So your parents uh, were in correspondence with one of the soldiers. Oui, yeah. oui. Uh, Harry, yeah. Mais après, on les a perdus de vue. Euh, bon, la vie a continué d'une manière différente pour chacun. Yeah. Hélas <laughs> And then after that, I, we lost track of them. Yeah, there. But just to add a detail, um, I did learn that Harry Kropnicki, Tall, Larry, and Smitty were all military police. So the reason that her family was able to make such a close relationship with them was because they were part of the sustainment forces at Utah Beach. Utah Beach had a gooseberry port, and so uh, there were over a million men and machines that came in through the port of Utah Beach and then joined the Red Ball Highway and went on to the front. So those MPs stayed in the town to help with that, and that's why they spent so many dinners and things with her family. Um, once we came on this project, I wanted to find Harry Kropnicki, Big Smith, Tall Smitty, and whatever, Tall Larry and Smitty, and um, I could only find uh, Harry Kropnicki, but I did find Harry Kropnicki. He was uh, buried in Florida. I told Danny, she wrote him a card based on 1944 paper, and uh, I went to Florida with some of our team, found a World War II veteran, and we had a ceremony for Harry Kropnicki that we videoed for Danny and then showed it to her to tell him thank you. Very nice. Mais nous avons eu le plaisir, alors qu'ils étaient encore en France et à Sainte-Marie-du-Mont en particulier, ils étaient toujours à la maison. Ils mangeaient toujours à la maison. Oui. C'était la famille. <laughs> We had the pleasure of having them a lot at home. They would come and, and have, have lunch and dinner with us, and they were part of the family. Ah oui, oui. Et bon. Euh, et par contre, je vais revenir un petit peu maintenant. Ce qui, toutes ces commémorations, tous ces événements dont, dont vous me faites l'honneur. Eh bien, cela m'a permis de rencontrer des gens formidables comme David Chapman, que j'ai eu l'occasion de connaître lors d'une commémoration, justement, à Sainte-Mère. Et puis, beaucoup d'autres, des messieurs que j'ai rencontrés ce soir, de... de comment... Aide-moi, aide je suis émue <rire> Voilà, euh, voilà, de, des personnes. Uh, I think over the years participating in those commemorations and being here tonight, it's been a wonderful opportunity to meet people like uh, David Chapman and also people tonight. Yeah. Voilà, j'ai eu aussi l'occasion de rencontrer des personnes euh, d'énormes quand même hein, avec euh, Virginie et qui maintenant habite les états unis avec son époux Denis. C'est des personnes superbes. Nous avons eu l'occasion aussi de rencontrer Donnie et non pas Denis. <rire> Denis et son épouse qui sont, bon, que j'ai eu l'occasion de rencontrer. C'est formidable, des gens très, très, très sympathiques et très gentils.
and meeting people like Virginie, who lives in the United States now with her husband, and also Donnie Edwards, who is here with us, and his, his wife. Were wonderful, wonderful, nice, nice people. Mais je vais forcément l'oublier, mais je vois Tina et je Tina. vois Véronique. Okay. Véronique. Et donc, ce sont des gens vraiment gentils et chaleureux. Je ne m'attendais pas autant d'honneur quand même. Merci surtout à tous les vétérans yeah. qui restent encore et qui restent encore longtemps, le plus longtemps possible en vie. Merci. Yeah. All warm and wonderful people, and a, a special thanks for veterans for being here this evening and all they've done. Yeah. Merci de, merci de tout cœur. Thank you, thank you so much. And and you, David, you're uh, so in the film. You're you're based in Paris already. You work for uh, the U.S. embassy, but you have a story behind your involvement in the film. Do you want me to tell it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's an interesting story. I was uh, in the Army for 30 years. Uh, and at the very front of that time, I went to a, a really difficult school called Ranger School. It's a leadership school. It doesn't matter. Uh, but you get very close with your team there, much like in combat. It's supposed to be so hard that uh, it emulates combat, minus some of the horrors of it. And my best friend from that uh, time is a gentleman by the name of Mark Janissey. Mark did his time, got out of the army, and went about his way. And I guess it was about 25 years later, uh, Mark's daughter and Christian's son went to homecoming dance. This is in Chicago, Illinois, near Chicago, not even related to where I am. And I believe it was over conversation when the parents meet, you know, overseeing uh, the kids' activities that she brought up this film and talked to Mark about the film. And ultimately, she said, hey, do you know anybody in Paris, France, maybe in the military? Well, I happen to be the senior defense official at the US Embassy in Paris. And he said, as a matter of fact, I do. So he connected uh, Christian to me. And, and I'll, I'll, it's a, it is a funny story. When you're in that position, you get a lot of phone calls. You get a lot of people asking for things. And it, it's all good, but you just don't have time for everything. But because it was Mark and my close friend from a long time ago, an old army buddy, I took the call. And Christian had the trailer for the film done at the time, and I watched it, and I was hooked immediately. And I said, what do you need within my authority? Let me help you get this done. So that was how it started. And it turned out that his office was the exact office that handled the D-Day commemorations. A little bit of luck there, better. too. <laughs> yeah, and thankfully, you see him jump out of the parachute. It, we don't say this, but he it's his last jump. What you just saw at La Fierre was his very last jump as a paratrooper. And so we were able to film that. His daughter was there. His wife was there. And he got a special permission to be at the drop zone. So that would never have happened without David. Yeah, you, you can't tell, but my wife is in a cameo and my little daughter's in a cameo. Can I tell them the story about with yes. Bob Devaney? Yes. All right. I told a couple of people before this. So there's a really moving scene when um, genuinely, as soon as I came off the drop zone, Christian ran over and put a mic on me, which is fine. Um, my wife and daughter, I think, were mic'd up too. Uh, ever the filmmaker. And so I came up to greet Bob Devinney and we had this heartfelt moment about how I, you know, we did it for them. And it truly was absolutely off the cuff. But there was a helicopter in the background because someone had gotten injured. And, and we had this really great moment together and, and I hugged him and I said, thanks, you know, for what you do. And then Christian said, that's great. Can you do all that again? Because there's a helicopter back there. <laughs> so I'm not a trained actor, but I did Repeat it all, and Bob repeated it all, uh, and that's what you saw in film was the second take, if you will, of that emotional moment. It's truly sentimental, but it was a second take. <laughs> you Please can don't tell. scare that. <laughs> you, you can tell. Uh, but you yourself were in the army for about 30 years, right? And I was wondering, because you watched the film again tonight, and I, could you tell us what it means to you to see um, to see the veterans there and to hear the French people talk about what happened, how, how they lived through it? And the veterans, I, I think there's, it's a beautiful part in the film, Christian, when you talk about the difficulty for them to, to come back, uh, which, you know, I think we don't speak so much about. You know, we always feel like 
just going back is a, is a great honor and you, you would be happy to go back, but I think the difficulty to grapple with what, what happened. What, what did it mean to you to see these films and to see, hear these stories, um, David? Well, I can tell you that, uh, again, 30 years in the Army, I've lived in or been uh, in eight different countries, actually lived and spent a lot of time in, in foreign countries. I learned more from the making of this film and the um, process of speaking with these veterans uh, over the time than I did in anywhere in any other place, simply because you were sharing something that you just can't describe it. When someone goes through something like that, like they did at such an early age, they go home, they go back to the farm or the city or wherever they go, and they go into their life. And then decades go by, and finally they return. And you saw a couple of examples of this where they didn't know what to expect, but as soon as they're on the ground and all the adulation comes out and the love, it truly does become a love story. And I learned more about humanity from watching that than any other place in any other time in the world. I'd like to say a related thing. In terms of what the veterans feel like when they get back to the battlefield and how they process it. I too learned so much by listening to the veterans when they were there, but I also have a son that fought in Afghanistan and had a very traumatic experience. And I want you all to think for just a, a little minute. Think about something very awful and painful that happened to you. Just remember it and think about that pain. Now imagine if I came to you and I asked you to tell me every detail about that incident. You probably haven't thought about it for a long time. It probably still brings up the pain and you'd pref probably prefer not to talk about it. Well, that's what we are asking the veterans to do. And that's why they never spoke when they came back. My son never did either until one, one night, he had a very bad night at home and called me. And for whatever reason, he began to tell me of a story about being in Afghanistan in a guard post every day. And every day, this little boy on a bicycle, a red bike, would ride by at the same time every day. And over time, they developed a relationship. It was just waving of a hand. But it happened every day, over and over again. They would see each other, and they would wave. And one day, that little boy was riding by at his usual time, and some very bad men stopped a truck and jumped out and took him. And very bad things happen when bad men take little boys in Afghanistan. And Hunter knew that, and he was ready to take the men out and asked for permission and was denied. And he had to watch that happen and never see the little boy again. And that was the most painful, horrible thing that ever happened to him when he was serving overseas and it haunts him to this day. But one day, for whatever reason, he told me. And then he, we talked about it another time. And as I listened and I asked more questions, he began, it began to loosen its grip on him a little bit. And he began to share it with other people. And the healing began. And that's what happens in Normandy. And it's coupled with unbelievable love and gratitude. So you have those two things happening. The veterans sharing their stories. And then them being lavished with love. And that is a powerful, powerful thing that the French people do with those veterans. And I would encourage everyone to think about that when you talk to veterans of war. They're carrying some deep and heavy things, but your love, your gratitude, really genuinely showing it to them will begin the healing. I didn't know that story, that's great. That's a new one I threw at yeah. you. Yeah, because I haven't talked to anybody. I'm a, a, an Iraq and Afghanistan, but, and I'm married to a psychiatrist. <laughs> And I don't talk well, to anybody David, we about have some it, work so. to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I do understand deeply what these men are grieving for and then growing out of when they come through 
Normandy, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. And, and you've been there many times, you said, right? And is that each time the same uh, emotion as well for you? Is that just as, I would imagine, just as meaningful, but the same, yeah, emotion of going back and welcoming veterans and preparing, you know, the, the festivities and the commemoration and... I'll, I'll give you a little different perspective. Uh, I do get um, a lot of joy from that. I get more joy from the children. I really do. I think um, watching the children engage with the veterans is just the coolest thing. Uh, and how the veterans just light up, you know, to see the kids, whether you speak the same language. or It doesn't matter. Um, and it just gives those, those folks another wonderful day on this earth to know that the gratitude is there, and especially from the children. So, so in the, the few minutes I got, that was about an hour interviews with Christian. She gave me like 38 seconds in the movie. I know how you got You're it. You're not the only out. one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we couldn't sit here for five yeah. hours. No, um, I did mention the children a lot because I really think uh, the youth and understanding what's happening and what's taken place is so important. So it's a different perspective. And I will say, too, I usually try to involve children in our screenings because it's wonderful for you to sit here and watch and listen and learn. But if you know high schoolers or middle schoolers, encourage them to see this film so that they can know and learn. That's a real passion and desire of mine for educating the younger generations. And Danny? I would like to say something that may seem de peu, de peu d'intérêt, mais vous autres parents qui êtes ici dans la salle et jeunes gens qui peuvent être aussi dans la salle, profitez, soyez heureux, ne vous plaignez pas, vous n'avez pas connu la guerre, vous avez tout ce qu'il vous faut, vous pouvez manger à votre faim, vous pouvez euh, jouir de la vie dans le sens propre du mot, alors ne grognez surtout plus pour euh, les petits bobos de la vie. <laughs> uh, I would like to say something, a, a little something that may not seem significant, but uh, you know, for you who, have, who may have children in the, in, in the audience, and if you have children, just to know that they can't complain and they have, uh, they can enjoy life, they can eat as, as they wish, and you can't complain and, and, and get over the little things that, that bother you because you haven't known and, with, and leave the war. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I want to make sure we I'm have... I'm sorry, one other thing. Yeah. You know, Flo Boucherie is sitting here. Yeah. Let me my introduce daughter. Flo Boucherie. She is my co-producer. This would never have been possible. This is Danny's daughter, but she's also my co-producer. So... Give it a round, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I know. And, so and I you, just want to tell just something so uh, when I met Christian it was very an amazing meeting because it was just because one picture we were waiting for paratrooper landing and there is problem with the aircraft so we are waiting for something and there is soldier just behind me so in front of me come and in this group of guys there is hunter Christian sounds. And so I, I stopped the guy and say, can I take a picture? I say, oh yeah, of course, yes. So Hunter just was close to me and I asked him, it, it was your first day and your first time in Normandy? He said, yes, but I'm not alone. I'm with my mother and with my brother, Jake. And so, okay, my family are here. They're my parents, my mother and my father and my mother. And so we start the meeting like this just only because a picture. If I stop the other group of the soldier, there is no movie. I want to make sure we uh, take some questions from the public. So if you want to raise your hand high, I can call you. And we have microphones, so make sure you wait for the microphones to get to you so we can hear you clearly and, and record as Thank well. Thank you for taking me because I have to go soon, but you know what I wanted to say, first of all, it was a wonderful film, yeah. but one thing I wanted to say that I'm one of the children who was saved, okay? But I was saved in southern France. I was saved by the, uh, um, 
by the Americans. Uh, on 1944, I was a hidden child, a Jewish child, so in, uh, near, um, between Grasse and Cannes. And uh, one day, uh, suddenly, we, we see, you know, I was in the countryside where I was hidden in this farm. And uh, the, all those, uh, uh, I mean, planes came, came and uh, there were all that uh, uh, flowers coming down, we're coming, we're coming, you know. And of course, uh, they're coming. The only thing is that uh, before they were coming, next, very next to us, there was a, a reservoir of German um, armament, which they blew away just before leaving and uh, we managed to survive. But the next day, we got up and we went to Les Quatre Chemins and here were all the American soldiers. And we, you know, yes, I also had my, my, uh, uh, <laughs> my dress, uh, but uh, white, blue and red. And, uh, you know, uh, done in different ways. And we just kissed each other. And the job was what, I was seven years old. And, you know, the soldiers just uh, embraced us and we all cried together and it was something wonderful. Mm. And then my, I just wanted to add, my well, future adoptive parents uh, invited them the next day and they all came and, you know, they were talking about their families in America. They were talking about their loves and their children. And, you know, it was so moving. And the, the thing I just want to add is that uh, one of them had a pair of gloves for his uh, fiance in America and who he loved so much and asked my adoptive mother to send it to her. And what happened was that amazingly, a decade later when I, I happened to be, at that time I was uh, uh, being a guide for Americans and there was this lady who happened to be the woman who had gotten those gloves but he had never returned and I want to just, I'm also to cry, you know, when I think about it. He was such a nice man. And that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so, thank much. You so much. Thank you, thank you. That's a gift. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, well, first, I think every person in this theater can do a great service to the nation by encouraging every little child you meet to smoke a camel cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Secondly, at Columbia University, we have undergraduates who come to the school. To my great surprise and disdain, they don't know a damn thing about the war. They've never heard of Churchill, let alone De Gaulle, or they've heard of Roosevelt, but if you ask them what do they know, they've, they've just heard the name. So my question to our honorees is, uh, are French youth knowledgeable about the war? Do they know about it? Uh, and uh, is it taught uh, in, in school? It's clearly not taught here. By the time they leave Columbia, they're, write, they're writing papers about the war, and, and they've learned a great deal. But do French children know about it, or French young, young people know about it? I can talk to about, about that. Um, it, it varies just like in America. So in America, you have people that do love history, and so they do teach their children. Um, in France, in Normandy, there is a lot more knowledge about the war than there is in other cities. Um, I have been told by French officials that they wish this was shown in French schools because most of the kids do not know the history. So I think it's the young generations in general that, that don't know. It doesn't really matter what country. I went around the United States, though, asking people randomly about D-Day. Do you know what D-Day is or when it was? And the only people that knew were two German tourists in Las Vegas. It's a great video if you catch it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, it's or, on it's YouTube. It's not great. Go to I mean, our it's YouTube funny. channel. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sad, it's but sad, true. It's sad, but it's funny. Next, who's got a question? Yeah. I'm uh, of retirement age and I'm getting back to uh, the value of early childhood education. And uh, because if we place our attention on a generation that's just growing up and as Plato said, give them some love, 
nurturing and encouragement and allow that natural sort of like creative life seed to grow and develop naturally, a child would naturally grow into a loving, compassionate being with a meaningful contribution to make. So what do you think about children have come up and placing our attention on bringing up a generation of children because the most creative, talented people should be the teachers and they are helping to mold and shape the lives of a future generation. So what do you think uh, particularly that the military might be able to do to make a meaningful contribution, like situation awareness, for instance, things like that, or what can, what do you think about that? Or what do you think an adult can learn from a child? I know it's a lot of stuff, but, okay, thank you so much. That's a tough one. <laughs> I, you, David. <laughs> uh, I can tell, and I'll, I'll go back to my military experience. I can tell you that military children are, um, probably a bit more worldly and know a little bit more about these things simply because it's in the interest of their parents. Uh, but the military as an institution tends to stay out of um, early childhood education or education in general, with the exception of the, the schools that are on military bases, which teaches to the standard curriculum. So I don't know if there's a linkage between the institution of the Department of Defense and you know, our children, but I can tell you within those who serve, our children tend to be more knowledgeable. I shouldn't say worldly, that's not, not right, accurate, but more knowledgeable about these things. I can tell you my daughter is. And I can tell you it starts with us. It starts with us, each individual. You know, there are children in our lives, whether they're child, their grandchildren or actual children or their nieces and nephews or there's a neighbor it, it starts with us. We can't wait for the government to solve it or the schools to solve it. So think about the children that you know in your life. Spend time with them. Treat them like I talk about treating the adults in the movie. Take them places. Read books to them. Teach them about the history and the history you think they should know. It's up to us to train that next generation. And I watched that example in Normandy. Take them to cemeteries. Teach them about their ancestors at the grave sites. Place flowers. Celebrate and remember on our holidays, not at a party or a picnic, but go to a cemetery. Remember a soldier. Go to a veteran's home. Do you know how many are forgotten in the retirement homes? Mm. Go and visit there. They are filled with veterans that people have forgotten. It starts with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's actually a, a good place to, uh, to close the discussion, but I think you wanted to call someone also. Give the, give the floor to someone. Yes. So um, we are wrapping up. And before we do, there are two important things uh, that I need to say. One, when you leave, you will be getting a card with the Girl Who War Freedom website on it. You can stream the movie or buy the movie, um, and you can buy a DVD. Please share that. You are helping to uh, pay for the film. It's not yet paid for, and if anybody wants to make a donation, you can do that on our website as well. We have a podcast called Documentary First that talks about all the behind-the-scenes stories from the beginning. We interview veterans. There's a great one, George Champa. We did five weeks with him. He was with the Grave Registration Service. There's lots of wonderful things to discover on the Documentary First podcast, also on our website. Um, so please go and check it out. Tell your friends. Now, something very important is coming up. Um, May 31st, we are having a World War II dinner, uh, recognition dinner in Atlanta, sponsored by Michelin. Um, in partnership with Delta Airlines, because the next day, Delta is chartering a flight with 30 World War II veterans all the way to Normandy for a whole week of festivities to honor them. This is only possible because of the Best Defense Foundation. And the Best Defense Foundation is started and headed up by Donnie Edwards, who I introduced earlier. And Donnie, I cannot thank you enough for helping make this dream come true. Come on up. Um, 
I think your motto at Best Defense Foundation is serving those that served us. Is that right? Did I get it right? Uh, yeah, close. It's uh, taking care of the ones who took care of us. There you go. Taking care of the ones who took care of us. So tell us about your vision and why you do what you do. Well, this is pretty amazing. My name is Donnie Edwards. I'm a former NFL player. I know I don't look like a linebacker, but I used to be one. I play one on TV. No, but actually, like, I'm so blessed to have this opportunity, this platform to serve our military veterans, and especially our oldest military veterans, our World War II veterans. We have one up here. Ar Arthur, are you up there? Can you wave your hand up there? <laughs> Arthur Grabene. We had opportunity to take uh, Arthur back a couple times now to the battlefields, and you know exactly what that meant for you to go back to Pearl Harbor this past December. We talk about it all the time, and you have great memories, and it means so much, and I know that, and that's why we do that, right? There's Arthur right there, yeah. But you know what? This, the story keeps going, right? So we're continuing the story of giving these veterans an opportunity to make sure that they connect with the liberated. Give them an opportunity going back on different terms, going back with their brothers and sisters so they can participate in the ceremonies, the celebrations, the gratitude by the French people, and so much more. And it's a great, great, great deal to be able to bring 30 World War II veterans. A total of 80 veterans are going to be going back on this special program coming up. So... Uh, with the partnership of Delta and Michelin, and all bringing it all together with the girl who wore freedom. I mean, th this is what it's all about, for sure. Yeah, and, and, I mean, I'm stunned. I know it's not been easy, that it's very challenging to put together this mission. It takes a lot of foot soldiers to do that. It also takes a lot of resources. And they are still taking donations every day to help these World War II veterans get back um, so if you can find it in your heart to make a donation, how do they do that? Uh, go to our website. It's just bestdefensefoundation.org um, or bdf.org. Um, we're all volunteers. We're all just paying it for. And our why is pure. It's because of the men and women that serve. We want to give back. And it's incredible that we have so many people, so many people that are giving so much to make things happen. And uh, with your support, we're able to do more of this and to give more veterans like Arthur and his son there, Doug, an opportunity to go back to their battlefields. Thank you. There's another veteran back in the back. I'd like to recognize his name. Can you please yell out your name and where you fought? What? Your name and where you fought. Carl Trignali, Brooklyn, New York. And where did you fight? What, were you with the Army? Navy. Navy. And, and were you in the Pearl Atlantic Harbor? Pacific and the Pacific. Pacific. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, one other thing is if you are flying Delta or Air France, the film is now there, so you can watch it there or tell your friends to. And if you are not flying Delta or Air France, you are making a mistake. So please... Make sure your fl next flight is with Delta and Air France. So thank you very much. Faith, thank you very much for coming this evening. We really appreciate it. I'll see you outside. You can see a parachute from Normandy, Invasion Money. We have a DVD out there for sale as well as books that I wrote. So thank you very much. Right on. Woo. And in two weeks, we'll be taking that flight over, that chartered flight with Delta Airlines all the way flying directly into Deauville with 30 World War II veterans. So the story continues and we'll continue to do it.